Welcome to the ISO Show, dispelling myths and sharing tips for success to improve your business with ISO standards with your host, Mel Blackmore. Hi, and welcome to the ISO Show. Thank you for joining me today. In today's episode, this is actually going to be the first part in a two part series with David Algar, who is the principal carbonologist from Carbonology. And the reason I've invited David onto the podcast is he's going to be sharing some insights into how businesses can create a carbon reduction plan in order to help them to get to net zero. And the reason why this is so important right now, obviously, apart from the environmental aspects of it, which are absolutely crucial, which is why all businesses should have a some type of sustainability strategy in place to help them to get to net carbon zero. But the main reason I'm talking about this today with David is because there is a government requirement to submit a carbon reduction plan. And David's going to be telling us all about that and how businesses can comply with PPN 0621. And don't worry, David's going to be sharing insights into what that is, what a carbon reduction plan is, how to create one, and a lot more, actually. So because of that, we're actually recording this in two parts, uh, because I think there's quite a lot of really useful information for our ISO show listeners. And uh, it's going to be beneficial whether your company needs to comply with PPN 0621 or not. So welcome back, David. Hi, Mel. Thanks for having me on again. Right. Yeah. So obviously the purpose of today is really to understand a bit more about these PPN 0621 requirements are and what a carbon reduction plan is. So, yeah, would you mind just providing us with some insights, please? Yeah, of course. So PPN 0621 or Procurement Policy Note 0621 was introduced back in June 2021. Hence the 0621 part, and it's essentially a tendering requirement for companies looking to win contracts in the public sector. And as you mentioned, this links to the government's net zero target. Just to, sorry to interrupt, David, but just to remind our listeners, what is the UK government's net zero target? Yes, so the net zero target refers to a government commitment to ensure the UK reduces its emissions by 100% from 1990 levels by 2050. So what this actually means in practice is that the new emissions produced by the UK are reduced to such a low level, they're essentially uh, naturally removed by the environment. Right. And who does it apply to? So PPN applies to public sector. So any businesses that are looking to work with education, local authorities, housing, infrastructure, transit, it's a big list. But one of the biggest ones on there is NHS, who has set a goal for net zero by 2040. So if you're looking to work in public sector, then you'll need a carbon reduction plan in alignment with this framework. Okay, great. We'll come on to carbon reduction plans in a moment. Uh, so is there any particular value then that, you know, if, if you're bidding, is it any value contract or is there, is there a cap on it? Well, yes. Yeah, so officially, this is for contracts with a total value of £5 million or more. But in April 2024, the NHS will be requesting a carbon reduction plan for all procurement that it does. But unofficially, this framework could be adopted by any business. So even if you don't work directly in the public sector, or perhaps you're a subcontractor, your supply chain may be requesting your carbon reduction plan soon. So as you could imagine, this applies to a lot of businesses in the UK. Yeah, and for some, this may be the first time that they've heard of a carbon reduction plan. So, I mean, let's look at why you actually need a carbon reduction plan. What, why, why is the government requesting this? So you could say that the government's targets and policies around net zero keep changing. You may argue in the wrong direction in some cases, but the overall goal of PPN 0621 is to encourage businesses to reach net zero before 2050, come up with a plan to do so, and then to actually implement emission reduction initiatives in the delivery of these government contracts. Mm. From a business perspective, what would you say are the main benefits of doing this? I would say there's two main benefits. There's lots of benefits, but I say there's two big ones. Firstly, it's essential for some tendering with as much as 10% of the weighting of the tender based on your carbon management and social values as a business. So if you put it really simply, if you don't produce one, when you're asked to produce one, you might fail the tender you're going for and you probably won't make the sale. 
So you'll need it to win new business and depending on how you operate, you might need it to retain some of your existing business. Therefore, if you're someone that works solely in the public sector, it really, really is an essential document. So that's the first main benefit I'd say for business, essentially you, you need it to operate. The second main benefit is that, you know, it's not just a piece of paper with a nice graph on it. It really is a great opportunity to investigate your business's greenhouse gas emissions and then to actually put a plan in place to reduce them. So we'll go into more detail on these specific requirements in a moment, but you'll need to investigate areas such as energy, transport and waste. This also helps you show to stakeholders you're actually committed to environmental protection. Uh, you could identify some cost savings in your business after going through all the data. You know, there might be something that stands out that you need to act on. And it will also be a great addition to your ISO 14001 environmental management system if you have one. Yeah, that, that's a really good point, isn't it? And, and also, I guess, ISO 50001, you know, if you've got that core structure in place of either an environmental or energy management system, it's going to be a great asset, asset to have, I would imagine. So what are the key requirements? So there's quite a few. The first one you need to do is make a commitment to achieving net zero by 2050 at the latest. And this commitment also includes annually calculating your emissions and, of course, updating the carbon reduction plan. You can pick an earlier date for the achievement of net zero if you already have one established, say, for instance, 2030 or 2040. But this will not impact how you're scored on the tender submission. The reason for this is to stop businesses you know, just, just making up a date with the hope it's going to go in their favour in the tender. So once you've made that commitment to net zero by 2050 at the latest, next you need to report an, a minimum set of greenhouse gas categories, so a minimum set of emission sources. So this refers to 100% of your scope one emissions, which are your direct emissions from assets that you own, such as, say, your, uh, your gas boiler to heat the building, your company vehicles. And this also includes any fugitive emissions, which are leaks of emissions from places they probably shouldn't have leaked from which for most businesses is air conditioning and sort of H HVAC systems. Next, you need to look at 100% of your scope two emissions, which for most businesses is pretty much just electricity, but technically it could include steam if you import it, but mostly just electricity. So those scope one and two that I just mentioned are generally a bit easier to collect data for and generally a bit easier to do the calculations for in terms of the emissions. Uh, you know, even if things are missing for those data sources, you can perform estimates. And if you're really lucky, you'll have access to the bills or physical meter readings. So yeah, scope one and two, generally the simpler ones. Then we move on to scope three. So scope three is the slightly more complex one because it's kind of the other category. So it's everything else fits in there. PPN wants you to report on five categories. There's a lot more than five, but PPN asks you to look at five. So those are waste generated operations. Your business travel, that's in vehicles you don't own. So staff, cars, uh, flights, trains, ferries, and anything you don't you know, own yourself. Next is commuting. So staff travel to and from work. You've got to be really careful here not to double count with any sort of claimed travel. So your business travel. And arguably the most complicated sources are upstream and downstream transportation, which is another way of saying goods in and goods out. So the physical transportation of goods. The significance and the complexity of these scope three sources really does vary depending on your type of business, but generally commuting and the upstream downstream transportation are the trickiest to manage. For commuting, you'll need to find a way to gauge how far staff travel into work, how often, what mode of transport they use, and among other things, it can get a bit complicated. For upstream and downstream transport, this refers to the emissions from third party transport providers. So again, vehicles you don't own and operate yourself. If you sell physical products, this will refer to goods being brought in for processing from your suppliers, you know, then process and then onwards to your customers. But even if you don't actually sell physical goods as part of your business model, you probably would have purchased some at some point to actually run your business. So this could be, you know, IT equipment, stationery, furniture for the office, building materials, etc. So again, yeah, even if you don't make and distribute physical products that you sell yourself, you probably would have bought some. And therefore, you're going to have some uh, upstream and downstream transportation in the mix. Yeah, I think that scope three is, is a bit of a grey area, isn't it? it? It does catch a lot of businesses out and causes quite a bit of confusion because they're not directly controlling it. And, and it, it is a result of other parties. Yeah, and it could quite easily catch people out. Are there any other categories covered by scope three that we should be considering whilst we're doing this? 
Yes, there are lots of categories. Uh, generally, when we produce a carbon reduction plan for our clients, we'll look at a few extra scope threes that we can get the data for. Common ones that we'll look at include water, home working. So obviously home working, remote working is quite a big thing now in 2023 still. So we'll look at that for our clients. And another big one is the emissions from the purchased goods themselves. So, you know, the emissions for actually making a good, you know, getting the raw materials out of the ground and transforming it to the point of sale. The benefit of this, it means if you look at the few extra sources, your carbon reduction planning can extend to other elements of the business. But in all cases, you'll need to report in tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, or you may see that as abbreviated as tons CO2E. Uh, this accounts for the global warming potential of multiple GHGs, so multiple gases. Mm, okay, no, that's interesting. I think especially as you mentioned home working, because so many companies now have hybrid working and that's definitely a key consideration, isn't it? From a point of view of, you know, are we saving on carbon emissions? Are, are we creating more? Because, I mean, we're recording this in, at the end of October and the heating's just come on and uh in in the uk so yeah that's another factor isn't it i think depending on where the company is located and, and home workers are located so i think yeah definitely kind of open to interpretation in some respects so obviously we we're recording this on the iso show and so i've got to ask the question <laughs> can we align a carbon reduction plan with an iso standard yes so we use iso 14064 part one the standard sets out a series of requirements and guiding principles for the quantification and reporting of emissions. You wouldn't necessarily have to go all the way to meeting every single requirement of the standard just for your carbon reduction plan, but we will always align with the key requirements, such as defining your boundaries and setting credible targets. Another thing that we'll do when we're doing the calculations for you, if you're really lucky, is we'll do your SECR figures. Yeah, so that's another another requirement, isn't it? So for listeners not familiar with the term SECR, could you just explain what that is, please, David? So SECR stands for Streamline Energy and Carbon Reporting. This is a mandatory disclosure of emissions and energy for businesses that are defined as large. So that's uh, businesses with 250 more staff or 36 million or more turnover or 18 million on the balance sheet. So there's three requirements. If you meet two or more, then you'll have to report on this. To put that in context, we generally refer to SECR as the baby of reporting because it's got quite a narrow window of requirements for energy and carbon. So despite being quite a small window of reporting, it's very important because it is literally legally required for some companies. So is it fair to say then you could kill three birds with one stone if you're working with a carbonologist such as yourself then? David, because not only would you be creating a carbon reduction plan to support compliance with PPN 0621, you're also going to be getting the ISO 14064 badge, which will help you to stand out from the crowd. That's a USP. And also get your SECR done at the same time. <laughs> Is that fair to say? Exactly. Yeah. A lot of these reporting requirements overlap. So, you know, if you do a little bit extra here and there, you, you do, yeah, kill two birds with one stone or three birds. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not that I've got anything about birds, by the way. <laughs> Sounds quite violent, but uh, yeah. So let's say you've you've calculated your greenhouse gas emissions. You've got your results. What next? So yeah, like you said, once you've actually got those results, then you'll need to look at the carbon reduction side of your carbon reduction plan. So to start with, what you'll need to do is outline the existing initiatives or existing projects that you have. For instance, a sustainable travel policy, uh, EV charging on site for your, you know, your staff's vehicles, or like we mentioned a moment ago, a hybrid working model. So people don't have to commute into the office, you know, five days a week. It's really important that when you're outlining these projects and initiatives, that they're actually relevant to the delivery of the contract you're trying to secure. In practice, that means don't include things that are going on, say, at your HQ in another country that aren't relevant at all, or something you did five years ago that now really isn't in effect. So once you've outlined those existing initiatives, then you'll need to look at the ones that you could do in the future. But again, bear in mind, these need to be realistic and relevant. So no crazy claims about, I don't know, switching your 100 vehicle fleet to a, you know entirely EV next week or eliminating 100% of waste. So in all cases, they need to be relevant and achievable. Once you've done this and you've outlined the initiatives, then you can actually look at the carbon reduction forecasting. So the numbers behind it. And that'll be the forecast between now or whichever you've chosen as your base year and 2050. 
again, I say 2050, but that could be an earlier date if you're working towards that. Uh, I believe we're going to go over how to actually set those targets and do the forecasting in the next episode. Yes, yeah, we'll have a, a bit more time to delve into that in, in further detail then. Yeah. So before we go then, David, are there any other tips or important information that we should be aware of that we haven't covered? Yeah, there's a few more. I'd say these are arguably a bit simpler. So the first thing you'll need to do is get the actual document signed off by a director or equivalent within your business. This is to demonstrate leadership commitment and show that you know it has actually been read by someone accepted internally. If it isn't signed off, you may fail on the tender. Next, you'll need to make sure you publish it on your website and make it nice and easy to access. So a simple solution that a lot of businesses do is literally have a link at the bottom of the web page. So try not to hide it behind 25 different links and make it difficult to find it needs to be easily accessible. And finally, and probably the most important one is you need to make sure it's kept up to date each year. Reporting for emissions generally occurs on an annual basis, so 12 month cycle. This can either be a calendar year or align with your financial year. That's um, completely up to you, but ideally you'll want to publish the updated version as soon as you can after your year end and certainly no longer than six months after. Again, another requirement is that an, an out of date carbon reduction plan may fail the requirements. Mm, okay, so that's uh, really useful for our listeners to hear that. So it's yeah, every 12 months like an MOT basically. And if you don't do it, it it's a failure. So yeah, pretty important if you're looking at tendering for public sector work. So I know we've talked quite a bit about CRP, but sometimes it can be difficult to try and actually visualise what CRP would actually look like. Could you try and describe it, please, David? Of course. When the government announced this requirement, uh, they're very helpful and they released a template document that businesses can complete. This helps simplify the processes for businesses that are reporting on emissions for the first time, but perhaps more importantly, it standardises the reporting. This means that all tender submissions can follow the same format and structure. Minor downside is the template is a little bit basic. So when you say basic, what, what do you mean by that and what's the alternative? Uh, so you're not marked on presentation. And again, it is important that you follow the formatting guidelines, but there's nothing stopping you dressing up a little bit, as long as you don't deviate from that template too much. What that could mean in practice is, you, you know, you could put some company branding on it, change the font, you know, change the colors, add a few logos, um, make the graph look nice or, you know, a cover page. So there's nothing stopping you dressing up a little bit. So it's a bit more visually appealing because end of the day, this has to be published online. So you want it to look nice and represent the company. What we often do is we call it a, a full version of your carbon reduction plan. So you have to publish this shorter summary version online, but in the background, we make this full version that includes further details. So that would be details about your organizational boundaries and a full disclosure of the methodology. So you can see how the calculations have been completed. And then you've got the option there to disclose your methodologies if anyone should ask. And that's the part that supports compliance with ISO 14064, is that? Exactly. Yeah. You know, if we just did this uh, two or three page document on its own, it wouldn't necessarily be fully compliant with ISO 14064 part one. But when we make this, you know, full version, which could be, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 pages, more for internal use, but again, it helps align with the standard a bit more closely and the most important thing from my perspective is all about transparency. So this full, larger document would have everything transparently disclosed in it. Yeah, and I think that's what a lot of stakeholders are expecting now. I think as, especially if, you know, you, you need to disclose this information, like you say, being as transparent as possible and looking at the methodology, it's not just a number. And I think, you know, if there are other internal stakeholders, it could be, you know, a board, for example, it helps to make decisions on where do we go from here in terms of our journey to net carbon zero? So, yeah, I think it's it's really useful information, you know, for leadership, definitely within an organisation. But what happens if you don't do one <laughs> or don't meet all of the requirements? Oh, yeah, that, that could be bad. So if you don't meet all the requirements without a valid reason, chances are you'll fail the selection criteria. The selection criteria is a bit like the marking scheme associated with PPN. So it's what you're judged on, essentially. So if you don't meet the requirements, we can't say for a fact this means you'll subsequently fail the tender, but it will have a negative impact. If you can't meet all the requirements, we advise that you explain your reasons why and commit to meeting them in the next cycle or as soon as possible. 
we're always of the opinion it's better to wait and get reliable results rather than taking a, a random stab in the dark, a, a very uncertain estimate, particularly for your base year. Your base year is very important. You want to get that right because it's what you'll be uh, forecasting emissions against in the long term. That's great. Well, thanks very much, David. That's a, a wrap for this episode. Thanks very much for uh, sharing your insights on the carbon reduction plans and PPN 0621 with our listeners today. Thanks for having me on. Looking forward to part two of this. Yeah, so in part two, we're going to be diving into carbon reduction plans in a bit more detail and hopefully answering some of those tricky questions that we get asked, you know, about setting carbon reduction targets and and forecasting as well. But David has actually produced a, a guide on this with some frequently asked questions that we often get asked uh, that will be available. So you can get that if you go to the podcast show notes, which will link you over to the Carbonology website. That's www.carbonologyhub.com. We're also offering a free consultation, I think, David, through a Carbonology. So if you would like to have a one-to-one -one conversation with David or one of our colleagues over at Carbonology to just explore this area in, in a bit more detail, you might have some questions to ask yourself, we would be more than happy to arrange that. So David, the link for David's calendar lay and how you can book a, a session with him will be available in the show notes as well. So that's all for now. Look forward to catching up with you on the next episode of the ISO show. Looking to use ISO standards to drive better business practice? Contact us at blackmoresuk.com to access further information and book your free 15-minute call.